Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fago Maradian in Orlando, Florida, where we are covering the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium. This year's topic, uh, command and control, as well as fusion warfare. Our coverage here is sponsored by DRS Technologies, and we are positively honored to have with us General Hawk Carlisle, uh, the uh, outgoing commander of the Air Combat Command, uh, wrapping up uh, 44 years wearing an Air Force uniform. Long time, yeah. Thanks, Fago. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. It's great to see you again. I love. Uh, opportunities to chat with you, so uh, this is a great opportunity to say a few things as I make my transition, <laughs> so thanks. Well, you're, you're going to be uh, up in the Washington, D.C. area, which, yeah. is, uh, which is great, uh, and thank you very much. It means a lot to me. I, w I wanted to start off with, um, you know, you've, you've spent um, a career as an airman, but also the last four years, you know, having your head in the future of air combat and where it's going to be coming off of you know, 15 years of counterinsurgency operations, more than that now. Uh, you could argue much more than that. The Air Force has been engaged in that since Maybe. the last Gulf War. Um, you know, what are, you know, and obviously you talked a little bit about here in fusion warfare, but what do you see as you look five and 10 years and some of the steps the Air Force has to take now? From an air combat perspective, what are the kind of capabilities the United States and its allies are gonna need? So I think, uh, you know, it's the things that we keep talking about. I think C2 is obviously a core competency. That's why it's so great to talk about it here at this, uh, at this event. And I'm a C2 zealot, and I have been for a long time. I think fusion warfare and, and what we're talking about here about that as well. But we really have got to look at, as we look at next generation, is how do you, how do you enable all the technologies? How do you get to that level of uh, 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 to operate in a contested or denied airspace? How do you do multi-domain work at a level and at a speed uh, that is inside of anything an adversary can either sense or react to? So, uh, you know, when we look at where we're going in the future, obviously. Uh, our challenge today is we got to win the war we're in, and and obviously we're all in. We're making that happen, Secretary Mattis and and uh, and our chief and secretary. That's the job we have to do. But we do have to look to the future. So as Air Combat Command, uh, one of our jobs is to pre present ready combat capable forces to combatant commanders today, but also to build, train, organize, and be able to execute in the future. And so in the future, we know that every potential adversary in the world knows that if the United States owns air, we'll win. And so they're trying to deny that. So we have to stay ahead of them. And, and C2 fusion warfare, penetrating capability, weapons, directed energy, uh, those are all the things that we're really striving out on is take advantage of the technology that's out there. When from a uh, distributed ops capability and the ability to sort of reach out and, and touch folks is, is very, very important in that context. As you look at what do, do we need to have longer ranged systems than we have now today? I mean, if you look at it, for example, the F-22 is a tremendous airplane, but you know, not as rangy as maybe we would like. Right. Joint Strike Fighter is a great airplane, not as rangy. We've taken right. some compromises on the B-21. Still gonna be a great capability, but we've always had strategic bombers with considerable range. Right. I'm not asking you to comment on that. Right. No. Uh, but do we need to actually change some of our programs to reflect the need to be able to operate, to penetrate, and to operate in places where we, there may not be tankers, that it will be denied in very, very contested airspace. Yeah, I think we do. I think range and payload and endurance are all big factors. I think there's a complementary piece of that. I think B-21 is going to be an incredible platform. I believe we need, you know, I think 100, 110, 120. Those are minimum numbers. I think if we could get to more, that would be fantastic. We'll see as time goes on. How many more? Uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't want to venture a guess. I mean, uh, in the case of you never want to have a fair fight, more is better uh, in B-21s. you got to see what that's going to cost you, but it, it's going to be a great airplane. So I think range, payload, and endurance are incredibly important. Remember, you can add some of that with uh, weapons as well, so you can get range and payload and endurance with weapons in the future, especially the technology we're going. And I believe there's a combination of manned unmanned teaming. I think there's unmanned capability. You look at the range and endurance of some of our unmanned platforms today and what they're able to do. So now where, and you, you have to have the man in the loop, but where is that man or woman in the loop and how does that work? So, uh, and you can have autonomy, semi-autonomy, 
so there's a lot of ways to add range payload and endurance that's not just bigger airplane with a person in it that flies longer. You can send things out. You can also do stuff from on orbit. You know, you got a pretty good range of endurance on orbit, right? So uh, space is, a, is that multi-domain operations and how we operate and, and what we do in that uh, ability to tie all those systems together across all those domains is going to be the key to the future. You, um, one of the programs, you know, you said about the fight today, I want to sort of split. I want to ask you about the flight today and then go to something that's in the future. For the flight, fight today, there are those who argue, uh, and certainly there are folks in the incoming administration who've argued, and it certainly helps in achieving a political goal of buying a lot more airplanes, especially if you buy a lot more lower end airplanes and you buy them a lot more quickly. But there are those uh, who fear that getting too many counterinsurgency aircraft is going to be problematic, especially if it takes away from the top line. Uh, for example, you've called on as many joint strike fighters as possible, as many F-35As as quickly on the ramp as possible, and yet the A-8 has argued, well, you know, we'll, we want to, you know, maybe get a f slightly fewer of those. Is it a good idea to get a couple of hundred counterinsurgency airplanes, or is that something that in a few, you know, how many is the right number, and is that something that we may end up regretting, say, five five years from now? So, um, F-35, buy rate, buy rate, buy rate. I mean, there was a time when we built the 2010 budget that by the year 2015, we're going to buy 110 a year. Clearly, we're not, and we're never even program, programmed to get to that level. So, I'm, I need to recapitalize my force, and I need to get the age of the aircraft, I need to get the technology, I need to get the systems out there. So, buy rate for the F-35 is very, very important to me. Um, I think on the on the light strike fighter, I don't know. I think that's a question. So there's, uh, I, I will tell you, I put it in the context. I think Secretary uh, Disbro did a great job talking about this morning. Is there long-term O&M savings? Ultimately, when we buy these platforms, the initial procurement cost is expensive, but the the cost to own and operate them over time, the O&M cost to keep them and do depot on them and maintain parts on them and, and, and keep them healthy, that's that's a big, that's a lot, that's the bill. So the question is, if you get a light strike fighter, that O&M bill for the long term becomes down quite a bit. So what is the business case and how much can you really save in that to be able to do other things potentially at that high end fight, more B-21s, more F-35s, penetrating counter air, penetrating electronic attack. So there's a very valid argument for that. At the other end of the spectrum is a light strike fighter is is it what the combatant commanders need? The threat environment we're operating in is getting worse, not better. Um, so, you know, the w even in the violent extremism, they're gaining capabilities. So uh, if we have a light strike fighter, uh, in, in the short term, it'll take money away from something else. And is it going to be what the, you know, the combatant commanders can go, yeah, I'll use that, bring that into the fight, or is the threat environment and the dynamics and what the combatant commanders want as a ready, capable force, does the light strike fighter meet that need? So that's one of the reasons we're going to do the test. And so I think there's some, uh, some validity in the test to, to learn some of those answers. Penetrating counter air, you mentioned that. Obviously, you were also PACAF, so that's, that's a part of the world you're familiar with. Talk to us about why that airplane is important, especially given the kind of capabilities, for example, that Russia and China, the anti-access area denial systems that they're developing. Well, you know, it's the it's the technology we have to get to. It's out there. We know our adversaries are trying to, our potential adversaries are trying to counter us in every different dimension, and they know that. Again, if you look at our fifth generation aircraft, F-35s, uh, F-22s, uh, what's going to be the B B-21, B-2, is that they're going to continue to try to counter those. Uh, we know that we can get the next level of technology, and we need to get it out there. And we need to know, we know that in very stabilizing and in a deterrent mode, we have to be able to hold enemy targets at risk. And to do that, you have to penetrate some pretty dense environments. So the PCA is really, it's a deterrent. It's a an ability to uh, stabilize things by saying, hey, by the way, we have the ability to penetrate and hold targets at risk. Uh, anywhere, and so PCA and uh, and what we're going with that airplane is our ability to have that deterrent factor, and if called upon, to go to use those airplanes to penetrate and hold targets at risk, including on the electronic warfare side of it. Right, and that, so I, I think if you look at what us and the Navy are doing, uh, and we're coming together, electronic warfare, electronic attack, electronic protection is incredibly important. Uh, I believe there's a need for both stand-in electronic warfare, electronic jamming, stand-in jamming, and stand-off jamming. 
and the, we've kind of divided it up a little bit within the Air Force and the Navy. In the Navy and their fleet defense and CSGs, they're doing more of the standoff jamming, and we in the Air Force are progressing, and we've not done it for a while because of the fight we've been in. It wasn't necessary, but for those future fights, our ability to get stand-in jamming with penetrating platforms is very important. So we're going to, as a Department of Defense, we're going to do both of those with the Navy kind of leading the standoff effort and the Air Force leading the stand-in effort. I, I know your time is tied. I want to ask you, um, you a couple of questions quickly. Um, you were PACAF, you were an advocate of air-sea battle, closer c cooperation and integration between the Air Force and, and the Navy, especially when it comes to some of these anti-excess environments. Are you satisfied that enough work was done there and that there is a foundation and that both of the services are on a collaborative and cooperative track because if you look at it there are some things they're doing divergently for example the delay in getting long-range strike unmanned aircraft off of a carrier deck you know we're, we're going for a whole bunch of administrative and other reasons to a refueler are you satisfied that that all that work you know is positive and is going to be bearing fruit ultimately yeah, I'm really, actually, I'm happy with it. And if, uh, you know, you look, it's a, it's a joint concept now. It's been uh, uh, adopted. Uh, all the work we did, I, they've, we've changed the name of it, and I can't remember it off the top of my head, actually, but we've changed the name of it, but it's a joint concept. It's uh, talked about in the Joint Air Dominance Office. Uh, it's, uh, it's both uh, in the Joint Staff talks about it, Army and Navy's, or Air, Navy and Air Force and Army and Marines talk about it, and what Shags O'Shaughnessy and Admiral Harry Harris, the PACOM commander, are doing, and uh, Admiral Notso Swift, PAC Fleet commander. We had a great foundation, and we're continuing to move forward. Uh, you could always do more. we got work to do. we got a lot of work to do. The uh, Navy Air Force integration on the data links is one, and we're making great progress, so we do have things to do. I think the NIFCA CA is a great concept. It's got some work that we have to do to tie into that as well, and that's part of that data, uh, data link and that network uh, capability. Uh, and again, I think if you look at it, uh, what Harry Harris is doing with Shags O'Shaughnessy, not so swift, it's moving very much forward. We're doing the same thing in many ways in Southcom and working with, uh, with Southcom with 12th Air Force. I know that uh, Todd Walters in, uh, is working with Scap Scaparati and what's going on in the MED. Uh, so I think Air Sea Battle was a great foundation. We've evolved it. It's getting better. We've got a lot of work to do, but we're moving down the right path. What are the capabilities that our potential adversaries are developing that keep you awake at night? I think uh, their, their uh, desire, one of the things that I think we really have to take on and get better at, and that is, uh, I think, uh, base defense. Uh, because we know that, you know, if you look at potential adversaries out there, their ability to do cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, to try to deny us basing capability, I think that's one of the ones. Integrated air and missile defense, there's some technology out there in directed energy where you can have a huge magazine for a low cost, and you can do some work to defend your bases. And to think that we could render many of their, all of their cruise missiles and ballistic missiles uh, ineffective by some kind of robust base defense capability. That's a huge game changer. That and then as we're moving out in the in the fighter force is directed energy self-defense capability. So now we, those high-end SAM systems that are, if we can do something at a low cost, high magazine depth, that's very effective at defending our aircraft. Those are the two things that I think we can change the calculus drastically if we do base defense, integrated air and missile defense at the level we know we can do a lot to include directed energy. We can do protection of aircraft with directed energy against the high-end SAM systems. And then as we move forward on electronic warfare, those are the three things that I'm really looking to work for. Last question, uh, an important cultural one. Um, you know, Dave Deptula and I were talking, and he, and he made a, a great point. 85% of those wearing the uniform now came in since 9-11. They've known counterinsurgency, that's been the focus. Your generation was very much peer on peer. You had World War II mentors, Korean War mentors, Vietnam era mentors uh, who brought you up and you guys were, uh, you know, you graduated in 1978, which was kind of the peak of the height of the Cold War. Uh, a lot of tensions going on and so everybody's head was in the game. And the Vietnam generation had a lot more in common with the World War II generation. They got shot at, 7,000 aircraft were shot down in that war, 15 B-52s. Um, what is the change that needs to happen in the Air Force um, to get back into that cutting edge mindset of high intensity, big league, state on state, 
potential conflict? Well, I, you know, I, it's uh, first of all, I'd tell you that we have incredible airmen. And so the warrior ethos that is in all of our airmen across the entire spectrum, what the United States Air Force does in the joint team is, is in cor extraordinary. Um, we, I think we as a nation, uh, not ju it's not just the Air Force, it's a nation, it's all the services, Department of Defense, it's the whole of government. As we look at near peer or peer competitors, uh, we have to start looking at what it takes to do that. Our airmen are incredibly smart. And uh, that, that, that warrior ethos that they've developed, and, and we are the most combat experienced uh, fighting force in the history of the world. Uh, having gone through, we've gone in case of the United States Air Force, we deployed in August of 1990 and we haven't been home since. Uh, so we're, we're uh, that ethos is there. I think we uh, we as leadership, we as a, as the administration and Secretary Mattis and uh, General Dunford is, um, we've got to acknowledge that there is people that understand uh, the way to counter the United States is you have to get to that high end. We have to acknowledge that uh, we're going to have to continue to lead that our technological gap or uh, advantages are gonna be dwindled over time as adversaries continue to try to, to counter us. The good news for us, I will tell you, is we always lead the way. People copy us. You know, you know, you see the picture of the J-31 and the F-35 side by side, and people go, wow, look at how much stuff they took from us and look at how much they copied us. And you go, yeah, they did, but they copied us because we lead the way. And so we just gotta stay on that. And I tell you, that's what our airmen want. Uh, that's what our nation has to do is we have to acknowledge that we still have to be the people that we're the best because the way we think and we have to keep thinking of what's next and how do we get to that next capability because our adversaries are going to keep potentially chasing us in that. 40 years in uniform, what are you reflecting back on? What are you remembering and what are you going to do next? And what are you going to miss? That's a multi-part. You can take it any way you want. So I, I, I will tell you, too, uh, I won't take too long because I can talk about this for hours. Uh, I'll start talking about it next week at my retirement. I would tell you that uh, I'll miss people. Uh, the quality of the people that are in our United States Air Force is unbelievable. I have sat at the table with the leadership in the Air Force uh, since I was fortunate to have my last two jobs uh, since uh, summer of 2012. And I will tell you that the quality of the people we have leading our Air Force and the quality of airmen we have in our Air Force is extraordinary. It's the greatest organization in the world, and I love them, and I'm gonna miss every bit of the opportunity to see those men and women every day. Um, I will tell you that I think the part uh, for me is um, I owe the Air Force. It's not the other way around. Uh, the opportunities the Air Force has given me, the gratitude is all mine. You know, I said it the other day, I'm you know the youngest kid of a cross-country truck driver, and I got to do things that and be with people and be part of something that mattered, made a difference in the world. And I got to do it with the greatest people in the world and I have had opportunities beyond belief. And for that, I am eternally grateful to our Air Force. And what are you gonna do next? Uh, that's a good question. I'm gonna uh, start uh, taking orders from my wife in, uh, in every realm. Uh, we're gonna move to the Washington DC area in Northern Virginia. I'm gonna go spend a month in Scotland, uh, take care of my grandbabies for a little while and, uh, and rest, I think, for a bit of time. Sir, thanks very, very much. Thanks always for your accessibility. Thanks for your insights, and thanks very much for your service. All the best thanks, for what's Margo. ahead for the family. Thanks, I appreciate it very much. You take care. Look forward to seeing you more. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you.